Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and for following us as we have been presenting to you this fascinating series about the Islamic Sharia law. And uh, we have been talking about some really, really powerful contents in the Sharia law to support at least the actions taken by uh, our Muslim friends, Muslim neighbors, when it comes, for instance, like last time, to uh, actions against those that in their mind are perceived to have been blaspheming against the Prophet, which is uh, unfortunate because the actions, uh, you know, that they, uh, or the accusations that someone is blaspheming against Prophet, uh, results oftentimes in killing that individual, which is a pretty sad, really, uh, state of affair. And it shows the status of Muhammad, and it shows how highly elevated uh, himself, even above Allah, because when you blaspheme Allah, for instance, you're not going to get killed, but when you blaspheme Muhammad, it's a whole different ballgame. Today, we're going to talk about kufr or infidelity, technically speaking, and it is uh, why it is against ijma. With me here, as always, our dear brother, uh, Lloyd DeYoung. Lloyd, welcome back, brother, and uh, thank you so thank much you. for this material. You're very welcome. I'm glad to be able to share this here. Today, just briefly, I will introduce the capital crime of kufr. So Kufr obviously has to cover, right? You said infidelity, it, but denying the ijma is actually Kufr. So, and it is a capital crime. So I will go to the slide and I'll show you this. Now, someone raised among Muslims who denies the obligatoriness of the prayer or deny something else upon which there is scholarly consensus, the ijma, that word again, which is necessarily known as being of the religion, thereby becomes an unbeliever, a kafir, and is executed for his unbelief. Uh, now, of uh, course, we know that... Once again, brother, them, if you don't mind, for those who just joined for the first time, ijma is the consensus. It's like you have a group of scholars can have a consensus about a ruling. Just going against that consensus, that's what uh, you know. Lloyd is talking about, is considered to be kufr. Yes. So understand the consensus of these scholars is of supreme authority within Islam. Their interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah is of supreme authority and cannot be rejected or denied. Now, of course, we do know that this does happen, it certainly does happen. However, one must understand that, I'm not going to go into this now, but there is a very detailed doctrine of lying and deception within Islam. That's something I will cover in detail at another time. But there are certain rulings which allow them to deceive, even to outright lie. And yeah, let's just briefly go back into this again. I will come to this slide on occasion because I need to refresh you about this, but there are more than, there's more than one division. There are two divisions in Islam and four levels. Two divisions, four levels. You have the Sharia. We're discussing the Sharia, the law. This is the legislative side, right? The Sharia is all about obeying Allah. And of course, you have the Imams enforcing the law, the lay Muslims obeying the law. The Sharia and the practice of lay Muslims is the Zahir. This is the outer, the exoteric practice. This is the external practice. This is simply following the rules. Then you have the, so this is also the first plain level of meaning. So when you read the Quran, when you read the Sunnah, you get the initial plain, obvious meaning. There are three other levels of meaning above that, but these are reserved for higher grades of scholars. So this is a pyramid of knowledge, and the top layer of knowledge is on top of it, and there's less and less knowledge as you get to the bottom. So for the scholars, they operate on a second division called the Hakika. This is the area of knowledge. This is the technically the spiritual, the occult side of Islam. Hakika is about knowing Allah. It's about knowing the character and the personality of Allah. The other side is simply just obeying the regulations imposed by Allah and Muhammad. Muhammad and Allah are both known as the lawgivers. And in fact, in the Sharia, Muhammad is synonymous with Allah. His word has exactly the same authority. They speak with the same voice. Now, the Hakika is, this forms the inner esoteric aspect of Islam. This is the hidden knowledge, right? So this is the Batan as opposed to the Zahir. This is inner, direct, personal knowledge and experience. In fact, it is the gnosis of Allah. Now, Again, I, I will make, and I have made some blunt statements, but do understand when you read the Sharia, the Sharia legal manuals explicitly state that Islam is a Gnostic religion and that these scholars are Gnostics. 
Now, there are four levels. The four levels, so you have the two divisions on the four levels. The lowest level is the Ibarra, the literal level, the Zahir. This is imposed on legislative subjects. Two, you have the Ishara, right? Your imams, they go to seminary, they study these books. They have an understanding at the level of the Ishara, the implied, the allusion, the sign, the gesture, the hidden meanings, okay? They are the legislative practitioners. Then you have the Lataif. These are nuances, subtleties. These are your spiritual practitioners. Earlier, I mentioned that prayer is actually Fat al kifaya While certainly prayer is also Fat al ain in other words, a duty imposed on you. You saw there that you're killed if you don't pray, and I will show you a ruling on that, that if you don't pray, if you miss a prayer, like under full Sharia, under the full implementation of Sharia, you will be killed on the spot for missing a daily prayer. But these are the spiritual practitioners. They're the only ones who have the knowledge and the ability to commune directly with Allah and then to spread that spiritual message to the entire ummah. This is exclusive to this, to this level of ulama. Then there's the highest level, the haqqaiq, the reality, the truth, the divine essence. These are advanced spiritual practitioners. Now, something I want you to know, allowing the forbidden. Islam is not a moral system of right and wrong. Islam does not have right and wrong. Islam has legal and illegal. It has halal and haram. However, because it is a legal system, it has legal loopholes and legal exceptions. In other words, the legal, sorry, the illegal can be made legal given the right legal exceptions. And sometimes those exceptions are so broad, they become dominant. Now, imams, you must understand, according to our understanding, a Western understanding, are not priests. They are lawyers, right? Not priests. They are lawyers. Now, dispensation is when what is normally forbidden is made permissible because of necessity or need. That's a very subjective set of ideas, but this is actually well-defined in law, and it's very detailed. Muslims always tell us, takia, well, you can lie if you're trying to save a life, your own or others. That's one example because they can morally justify it. It is much, much broader than that. For example, if someone is forced to make a statement of unbelief, kufr, it is made permissible to ease his hardship for him to do so as long as faith remains firm in his heart. In other words, you can lie as long as your faith is true, you can lie. But notice, mm -hmm. this is for example. This is an example. It's a justifiable example. Right. It goes much further than that. And I want to show one more thing. Do you have a comment, Al Fadi? While I yeah, go yeah, we have up? a proverb uh, that says, Al-Darurat to Halil Al-Muharramat, meaning those who are needed or necessary can make what is forbidden to be permissible. So if you are in a desert, you uh, got lost, you cannot technically speak and under Sharia law eat a dead animal, but now you can go ahead and eat a dead animal because, hey, you, get, you have to live. So God is going to look the other way. For instance, the fifth pillar of Islam, the pilgrimage, if you are unable to make it for a good reason to go to Mecca and perform the pilgrimage once in your lifetime, that's the only pillar that it says that Allah is willing to overlook that because you indeed had a something that prevented you from doing it. So I want to bring up, I mentioned prayer, right? The, remember they mentioned the Muslim who knows the obligatoriness of prayer. If a Muslim knows that prayer is obligatory, but neglects it, he is killed. He is committed kufr and he is killed. Let's have a look at the specific ruling in the Reliance of the Traveler, section F1.4. A Muslim who holds the prayer to be obligatory, but through lack of concern, neglects, neglects to perform it, has not committed unbelief. Thank heavens for that. Rather, he is executed, washed, prayed over, and buried in the Muslim's cemetery. ISIS did this. There were numerous baskets full of heads of ISIS Muslims. And remember, this is Orthodox Sunni Islam. This is the most popular Sunni Islamic manual in the world. This is Orthodox Islam. Under full Islamic law, full Sharia, ISIS will become more. Al-Fadi, over to you. Yeah, it's uh, just uh, a really... Uh Disgusting, that's all I have to say, uh, because now human life becomes meaningless when it comes to those kind of issues. And of course, under ISIS rule, it was like almost like they have Pharisees on the street making these decisions and ruling on the spot. I've watched an execution on video of uh, an older woman because just the judge became the executor and decided on the street when they captured her, 
that she's guilty and the uh, judgment is execution. And she was executed, you know, basically live on YouTube, which is uh, uh, absolutely disgusting to say the least. Well, brother, thank you so much, of course, for this. And uh, next uh, episode, hopefully, we'll continue along these lines, uh, unless if you have something else you want to add right now. No, that's it. I'm done. Thank you for the opportunity once again. Absolutely. And hopefully everyone who's watching this is developing a better understanding now why Sharia law is really a trouble for Muslims before it's even trouble to us. Because as a Muslim, it's almost like you have to be a perfect person to apply it. And if you got caught, you know, violating it, and if, you know, the uh, ulama or the uh, scholars really want to throw the book at you, you're toast. I mean, you're technically toast and you could be even executed and lose your life because they decided that you have violated something that is sacred. So uh, we need to definitely uh, pray for our Muslim friends to come to the Lord who will free them from this yoke and this burden. Until then, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.